Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And today's video is going to look at another achievement of arms. In this case, the arms of the Shakespeare family. They are first granted to John Shakespeare and from him they pass through his family line. So after John's death, the next recipient is his eldest surviving son, William Shakespeare, the playwright. I want to think about what claims John Shakespeare made in order to obtain these arms, what he said his right was. Also, there were people that disagreed that he and his family had the right to bear these arms, so I want to look at those counterclaims as well. And more recently, in the 21st century, a whole host of documents have been found in archives, and they are still continuing to be found. So I'm going to point you in the direction of this website where they are being hosted, and you can see various documents relating to Shakespeare and his family. Perhaps, particularly as more start to be found, we might get a better grasp on this incredibly elusive figure. But for now, let's have a look at Shakespeare, the gentleman. In early modern England, the term gentleman or moniker of gentleman is a very specific one that was attached to a very particular subset of the society. In a society where they are stratified about class and your status in life, these names matter. A gentleman is not themselves in their own right a member of the nobility. However, they may still be the son of a member of the nobility. If you take a knight, someone who can style themselves as Sir throughout their lifetime, they can pass on that title to their eldest son. So after that first person's death, their son becomes Sir a knight. Their second, third, fourth, fifth, however many sons they may have, cannot bear that title. It's only inherited by the eldest. However, because they have a noble birth, they can style themselves as gentlemen and pass that gentleman status on to any sons that they may have. The other way to become a gentleman is to do something in your lifetime that is deserving of the reward of that elevation of status. And similarly, if you do so and become a gentleman, you can then pass on that status to your own sons. Being a gentleman may not make you a nobleman. However, it does allow you to bear an achievement of arms. Shakespeare's Birthplace Trust points out the following fact about the number of gentlemen working and living in Stratford-upon-Avon. From 1570 to 1630, there were 45 gentlemen who were resident in Stratford-upon-Avon. In 1595, the population of Stratford-upon-Avon had been around 2,200. Of these 45 gentlemen that were resident during these years, 28 were gentlemen by birth, whereas 17 were tradesmen like John Shakespeare, who had successfully applied to be recognised in the status. When we talk about the origins of William Shakespeare, it's often referred to that he is William Shakespeare, the man from Stratford, the son of a glover. And absolutely he was. William Shakespeare's father, John, was a prominent tradesman in Stratford-upon-Avon. He was a glove maker. He was also somebody that took animal hides and created leather out of them, a rather smelly process, but one that allowed him to create the base materials for the elite products that he was able to make. And gloves, particularly leather gloves, could be extraordinarily elite fashion items. There are tales of Elizabeth I having sets of gloves that were so thin and so fine that they almost looked like a second skin. They were beautiful and flexible. Leather gloves could be heavily decorated and embroidered. And so they were extremely expensive fashion items that John Shakespeare is making. And clearly, if we look at John Shakespeare's life in Stratford, he certainly was enabled to rise to prominence, perhaps because of the wealth that his trade generated for him. So here's a little timeline of John Shakespeare's life. We know that John Shakespeare was born in around the 1520s in Snittisfield, which is a couple of miles from Stratford-upon-Avon. He moves into Stratford, however, by 1552. And in 1556, he has begun to acquire property in Stratford-upon-Avon, in Greenhill Street and Henley Street. The Henley Street House is Shakespeare's birthplace, and it is owned by the trust that bears that name. In 1557, John Shakespeare married Mary Arden, 
and together they had eight children, although only five would survive childhood. By practicing this enriching trade and being able to purchase property, it marks John out as somebody to be trusted within his local community. The year that he begins to acquire these properties, 1556, he is also made ale taster for Stratford. Through this appointment, John is then eligible for further climbs within the civic hierarchy. In 1558, he is made constable. In 1564, so the same year as William Shakespeare's birth, he is made alderman. And in 1568, he was made the high bailiff, a position that we think is equivalent today to being the local mayor. Unfortunately, this rise in social prominence and trust doesn't seem to have lasted that long for John Shakespeare. He is made High Bailiff in 1568, but from the early part of the 1570s, he starts getting into legal and financial trouble, and by the 1590s, his social capital has fallen to an all-time low. Nevertheless, there is, it seems, evidence that he was willing to capitalise on this rise to High Bailiff in 1568, because it's around this time, perhaps through to the mid-1570s, that he begins to inquire about earning an achievement of arms for himself and his family. In this early application, John Shakespeare makes the claim that his grandfather made some undefined but clearly very useful service to Henry VII. There is no record of this ever taking place, and it's quite possible that John Shakespeare was simply chancing his arm in order to earn this achievement of arms for himself and later his son William. Whether John Shakespeare makes inquiries or actively applies to be recognised as a gentleman in the 1560s or 1570s is unclear. We aren't sure of the exact date and we also aren't sure how far the process goes. What we do know is at this time at least he is unsuccessful. However, that would not be the case forever. And on the 20th of October or thereabouts of 1596, John Shakespeare is recognised as a gentleman, and this is the achievement of arms that becomes his. Shakespeare's Birthplace Trust estimates that it may have cost the Shakespeare's around £20 to be elevated to the state of gentleman and to get this achievement of arms. They and others see this later successful attempt as being made by William rather than his father John, and this makes quite a lot of sense. By the 1590s, and certainly by 1596, John Shakespeare doesn't seem to have access to either the fiscal or social capital that would warrant him being styled as a gentleman. Equally, many have argued that William would rather inherit the title than buy it for himself. They claim that it would have had a greater cachet that somehow being an inherited gentleman, passed down from father to son, makes you look slightly more like old money, whereas perhaps the newly minted gentleman in his own lifetime looks a little bit nouveau riche. If it was the case, and I think it probably was, that William Shakespeare was the prime mover behind his father getting this achievement of arms and the state of gentlemen on or around the 20th of October 1596, then it's perhaps safe to assume that in doing so, in achieving this, William also would have felt a profound sense of irony and sadness. In August 1596, William Shakespeare's son Hamnet passes away. Now, of course, he may have hoped of more sons to emerge from his marriage to Anne Hathaway, but as it turned out, this did not happen. And while William Shakespeare was able to inherit the state of gentleman from his own father, he himself had no son to pass it on to. We cannot speak explicitly to William Shakespeare's grief or disappointment, because he leaves no record for us, at least not one that is extant. But I think we can imagine. The process of obtaining an achievement of arms, of being recognised as a gentleman, is not one that takes just a few months. It's a far longer journey than that. And if it was William that was motivating this move in 1596 to have his father recognised as such, he would have done it months and months before Hamlet's death. He would have intended to inherit the status from his father just as he would have intended that his son would inherit from him. But now, just before the achievement was granted, that last part goes away because Hamnet has died. The Shakespeare achievement of arms takes the following form. In the centre we have a gold shield. On it is a bend sable, that black diagonal bar. On the bend sable is a spear of gold. The spear of gold is in quotes steeled argent, which means it has a silver tip. For the crest there is a falcon with wings displayed argent or silver. The falcon stands on a wreath of Shakespeare's colours, 
and supports a gold spear with a silver tip. It is set upon a helmet with mantles and tassels. The falcon is shaking the spear. It is also possible, although this is debated, that this achievement of arms came with the motto, not without right. Essentially, a direct challenge to anybody who claims that the Shakespeare's do not deserve to have this achievement of arms and the status of gentlemen. If the Shakespeare achievement of arms did indeed bear this motto, not without right, it may seem a little bit defensive. Why do they feel the need to get out in front of a claim that they don't deserve this achievement of arms or the status of gentlemen? Who said something? Well, in 1599, perhaps we have the explanation as to why they were a little bit sensitive of their new status. Because in that year, 1599, Shakespeare's fellow playwright, Ben Jonson, produces a play for Shakespeare's own company, The Lord Chamberlain's Men. The play is every man out of his humour, and it is a sequel to his successful play of the previous year, Every Man in His Humour. In this second play, it seems evident, to me at least, that Jonson is making a joke at Shakespeare's expense. He stages the character Sogliardo, who, to be kind, is a country bumpkin and hanger-on, who has purchased an achievement of arms and is mocked by his companion Knight. The Knight tells him that the motto beneath his achievement of arms should read, not without mustard. So it seems to me quite evident why people are making a connection between these two things. Shakespeare's achievement of arms and not without right, and Johnson's joke about not without mustard seem to be very similar phrases. Equally, the fact that on the Shakespeare arms the shield is this golden colour, perhaps some might say it is mustard yellow, could also be a connection. Johnson and Shakespeare, however, at least by Johnson's account, were friends. So is this gentle ribbing, one playwright attacking the social aspirations of his fellow? Is he calling him a social climber in a jestful and friendly way? We'll never know. Nevertheless, a more significant attack on Shakespeare's status of gentleman would come very shortly. In 1602, this document is created. Ralph Brooke, the College of Arms Herald, submits a list containing 23 so-called mean persons who, to his mind, had been wrongfully granted this elevated social position by the Garter King of Arms, William de Thick. Ralph Brooke's complaints against the elevation of these 23 individuals comes in one of two forms. He either thinks that William de Thick has been bribed to put them in this position, that the individuals are undeserving and have used their cash capital to elevate their social position in an unfair manner. The other tack he takes in these complaints is to state that some of the achievements of arms contain insignia or badges or mottos or shields that are too similar to other existing achievements of arms and therefore could create dangerous confusion as to who is whom. Unlike some other members of this 23-person strong list, no record survives, or at least has yet been found, of Shakespeare's response to being included. But it does seem, however strong Brooks' claims may have been, that he was unable to act against Shakespeare and remove the achievement of arms or the state of gentlemen from him. Indeed, it seems that it might still be being used by the family in 1670. In that year, Shakespeare's last surviving descendant, his granddaughter, Elizabeth Barnard, passes away. And on her will, she has a wax seal. And within that wax seal, according to one Folger employee, you can see a barely visible fragment of Shakespeare's achievement of arms. It's telling then that this long after Ralph Brooke attempts to take away the achievement of arms from Shakespeare, his family is still using it. That this last member of the Shakespeare line of descent still has this as part of her achievement of arms. But where is this information and these images coming from? Well, for a lot of it, we have to thank this woman, Heather Wolfe. She is the Folger Curator of Manuscripts, and in 2016, she amazingly finds a number of previously lost documents which related to Shakespeare's baptism, burial, family matters, property records, legal actions, business dealings, and, of course, his admission into the College of Arms as a gentleman with the right to bear this achievement of arms. As a mark of how important this growing collection of documents is, in 2018 they were recognised by UNESCO's International Memory of the World programme for their universal cultural and historical value. Why were John and William Shakespeare seemingly interested in being gentlemen? 
in having an achievement of arms. Well, I think if we look at the 1596 attempt, the successful one, I believe that William Shakespeare was the prime mover behind it. And I also think that part of the reason for that is his own status as a player and playwright. For much of the history of playing in England, players were itinerant, indigent. They moved about the nation and they took their work with them. So they would turn up in a community, a group or band of individuals. They would stay for a few days and they would leave. And any mischief they caused or crime they committed could theoretically have very little repercussions for them. Other people didn't deem them to be very trustworthy because of this. In the late 1500s, of course, Shakespeare and his contemporaries start to lay down roots. They build playhouses in the liberties around London. And for some, they move into the halls and inn yards of London and start their performance work. But laying down these roots does not make their work any more respectable for many. And so is this possibly why Shakespeare wants to be a gentleman? For evidence of this, we can perhaps look at his contemporary Ben Jonson, he of the not without mustard joke. Because up until 1611, Ben Jonson was still paying his subscription to be included in the Guild of Bricklayers. Jonson's stepfather had been a bricklayer, and in times when Jonson was trying to build his writing career, he would frequently perform labouring jobs to make ends meet. It isn't until 1611 when it seems to him that his playwriting career has really taken off and is secure that he stops paying in. Membership of a guild was security for Johnson. Is it possible that William Shakespeare was attempting to obtain a similar level of security, albeit through a different path? Is the state of a gentleman, the right to bear an achievement of arms, Shakespeare's way of ensuring a social capital, preventing people from seeing him because of his profession of being untrustworthy? I'd love to know what you think, so do let me know in the comments section down below or come and find me over on my social media. I'll leave the links in the description box. Follow me there and we can continue this conversation. I do hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, then please let me know by hitting the thumbs up. Please also subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.